Brachos, Daf, Lam, and Vav. The Gemara will be discussing the halacha that a fruit which is not in its prime state of being eaten or part of a tree which is not the main fruit does not get the proper bracha. It gets demoted to a lower bracha. The Gemara will discuss a number of examples of this. We'll be speaking about fruit that's not in its right state. For example, we'll discuss flour, which is eaten raw. We'll discuss oil that's eaten raw. We'll discuss other things which are not really edible, such as salt, uh, pepper, ginger, or a couple of various types of porridge that are made from interesting ingredients. Then the Gemara will also be discussing the tzlaf plant, which has a number of different edible parts and what the proper bracha for each of those is. You know, we'll also spend a while discussing slaf and some other halachas that apply to it, such as orla, meiser, and the status of the shomer, the protective aspects of the plant. So the first sugya that the Gemara discusses is flour. If you're eating plain wheat flour straight in its flour form, what would the correct bracha for that be? So now, if you're eating bread, that's a mizonos or hamotzi. If you're eating wheat kernels, that's hadama, it's fruit of the ground. The question is, you take those wheat kernels and you grind them up into flour, does that stay a hadama? That's what a Yehuda holds. Or does it become a shahako because it's demoted, because it's not in its proper state? That's what Rav Nachman holds. So Gemara says that Rav said that Rav Yechon and Shmuel agree with Rav Yehuda that it stays a hadama. How do you know? Because they hold it. If you drink olive oil, the, ha- the bracha on it is Bari Priho eats. So you see that if you take a fruit and you transform it to another one, the bracha stays the same, right? You turn olives into oil, it stays the ha'etz. So in the same reasoning should apply to if you turn wheat kernels into wheat flour, it should also stay the same bracha, which is the hadama. The word says that Rav Nachman was not impressed. Rav Nachman says, how could you compare the two? Olives crushed into oil is the correct state. That's how it's meant to be eaten. So for, for sure it'll stay ha'etz. Why should it lose its level? But if you turn wheat kernels into flour and you don't take them all the way to bread, it's not its proper state of being eaten. It's supposed to be eaten as bread. So it's in a lower level and it's meant to be eaten. It should have a downgraded bracha and it should be a shahakal. The Gemara asks, but we see that Rav Zerah said in the name of Masna that if somebody eats either raw pumpkin or barley flour, you make a shahakal. And the implication is that it's only barley flour that's a shahakal, but wheat flour, which is more chashav, because wheat is more chashav than barley, which is usually animal food, so that should be a hadama. So that would seem to indicate like a Yehuda. The Lord says, no, that's not the implication. Barley flour is a shahakal, and wheat flour is also a shahakal. Why does it talk about barley flour, not wheat flour? You would have thought, if it would have said only wheat flour, you would have thought wheat flour is a shahakal, and barley flour doesn't even get a bracha at all. So it talks about barley flour to tell you that that gets a shahakal, but really the same thing applies to wheat flour. Umar says, what do you mean? I would have thought that barley flour doesn't get a shahakal, gets no bracha. How could it be worse than salt? Salt and salt water, we have a Mishnah. It says you make shahakal on it. Umar says, yeah, it could be worse. It could be worse because you eat barley flour, it makes you sick. It causes worms in the intestine system. So you might think you shouldn't eat it at all, and if you do, you should make any bracha at all. However, the bracha is that you do make a bracha because you do get some pleasure out of the eating of it. Okay, now the Gemara moves on to eating something called kaira. Kaira is leaves that grow on a tree. In their soft, unfully formed state, they're soft and they're edible. The Gemara wants to know, do you say a bracha net? So Rabbi Yehuda says you say a hadama, because it's considered to be fruit of the tree that it's growing on. And Shmuel says it's a shahako, because it's not really fruit. It's not meant to be eaten. And the main point is that it ends up getting hardened. Something which ends up being hardened, you don't say a bracha on it. When it becomes a branch or a full leaf, it's too hard to eat. So Shmuel said to Rav Yehuda, he said, you know, Rav Yehuda, you're really smart. You're the sharp one. Throughout Chas, Shmuel often refers to Rav Yehuda as the sharp one. He says, even though I hold that you should say a shahako because it's not in its proper state, you, what you said, that it's a hadama, is logical. Because look at radishes. Radishes, if you leave them in the ground long enough, they also turn hard. And yet we say a hadam on radishes. So these leaves, which... The, the fact that they turn hard should not be a reason to change the bracha. So, uh, I, I have a proof to you. So, Gemara says, uh, it's not such a good proof. Because the truth of the matter is, the bracha really depends on what people have in mind when they plant things. People who plant a radish aren't interested in what it's going to be when it becomes hard. They plant it for its soft, eaten state. So, the radish, even though it's going to get hard, 
that has no relevance on the bracha. The bracha is for when it's in its fresh state. However, leaves of trees aren't planted for the state that they're going to be in. Nobody plants a tree in order to eat the leaves of it because it ruins the tree. The Gemara asks, is it true that if you eat something which is not the reason you planted that plant, that you do not get a bracha on it other than shahako? But if you look at the tzlaf plant, the tzlaf is planted for its fruit, but you can also eat the berries and the leaves and uh, the flower, and uh, you would make a ha'etz on the berries and on the on the fruit and on the flower you say ha'etz, and on the leaves and on the berries you say ha'dama, so you see you don't say shahako. So even though it's not what it was planted for, you still say a higher level brachal in shahako. The Gemara says, no, but when you plant a tzlaf, you have in mind to eat those things. It might not be the main crop, but you do have in mind that they are edible parts of it. But tree leaves, even if they're edible, it has nothing to do, it's not at all intended to be eaten. And the Gemara says, the halacha is like Shmuel. Even though Shmuel praised Rabbi Huda, but the halacha is indeed like Shmuel. Good. Now the Gemara moves into a discussion of the tzlaf plant. The Gemara is going to try to figure out what the correct bracha is on some of the parts of the tzlaf. Now the tzlaf is called caperberry in English. It's the plant that grows out of the cracks in the coastal Amaravi. And it appears in many different halachos. The tzlaf has four main parts to it, which are all edible. There's the fruit. The fruit is variably called in this Gemara. It's called the pircha or the bitisa, but its main name is the evionis. That's the main fruit of it. That's the main edible. And the there is also a flower. Now the flower, it's an interesting thing. It's not the blossom we're referring to. We're referring to the flower that the fruit grows out of, and the fruit is housed in the flower, which protects it in its early stages of development. And then before it becomes ripe, this this flower falls off. So that flower is called kafrisin in this gemara. Then you have tamarais, which are not the main fruit, but they're berries that grow in the plant, and the leaves of the plant are also edible. So the Gemara's main focus over here is going to be on the kafrisin, this flower which protects the plant in its young stages. What is the correct bracha for that? So the Gemara wants to really know, is it a fruit, or is it not considered to be a fruit? Is it some other part of the plant? How do we view this kafrisin? So there's a number of different halachos, whether it's a fruit or not. First of all, what's the bracha? Is it a ha'etz, or is it not how it's a uh, slaf is a tree. The Gemara also will discuss is it chayv and arla? Arla is a halacha that applies mainly to fruits. It also applies to protective parts of the plant, which we'll get into later, but if it would be a fruit, it would be arla. Um, also, if it's a fruit, it'll be susceptible to hilchas meiser. If it's not a fruit, you wouldn't take meiser from it. The Gemara discusses the halacha of the Tzlaf plant, specifically the kafrisin, the protective flower that grows on it in its early stages. And the Gemara says, we have a Mishnah. The Mishnah brings a machlek is between Rebbe Yezer, who says that the kafrisin is susceptible to Hilchas Meiser, and therefore it's considered a fruit. And Rebbe Akiva says that it's not a fruit. You don't have to take Meiser on the kafrisin. And the, the Gemara quotes the Amira, Rebbe Yehuda Omar Rav, who says that the halacha of Arla in Chutz Arts does not apply to Kafrisin, the flower, which means that it is not a fruit. The Gemara asks, but we have a Brisa that says that the bracha on Kafrisin is a Bayerpia Eitz, which indicates that it is a fruit, and which is not a problem. The rice is going to look like Rabbi Eliezer, who said that you take Meiser from it, so it's a fruit, and Rabbi Yudamarav is going to like Rabbi Akiva, who says that you don't take Meiser because it's not a fruit. So now the Gemara takes a little detour here, and the Gemara says, well, if he's going like Rabbi Akiva, why does he just say halacha is like Rabbi Akiva? Why does he say his own halacha? The Gemara says he didn't want to say halacha is like Rabbi Akiva because Rabbi Akiva was talking about Meiser. And if he's going to paskin like Rabbi Akiva, that means that even in Eretz Yisrael, it has the halacha that Rabbi Akiva said, which is that it's not considered a fruit, and he wouldn't take Meiser from it. But Rabbi Yudhamar wasn't really willing to go that far. He was talking about Arla and Chutzar, which is a very mekel halacha. Arla and Chutzar is not even a midrabanan, it's a zecher. And the halacha is that you go like the mekel there. So he's willing to go like Rabbi Akiva Lakula in Arla's Chutzar. He's not really to paskin like Rabbi Kiva. So you asked, so, okay, so you don't have to paskin like him. Just say that in Chutzar, Salach is like Rabbi Kiva. He says, no, he didn't want to paskin like Rabbi Kiva and Hilchas Meiser altogether, because Meiser 
is Midura Bonan even in Eretz Yisrael. If you would paskin like that, you would think that that's just because it's a Dura Bonan in Eretz Yisrael, so he's paskining like him in Chotzaraz. We want to talk about Erla, which is the rice in Eretz Yisrael. And we paskin Lekula in Chotzaraz, and that's why he said the Halacha. He didn't blame it on Rabbi Kiva's Shita, because that wouldn't give us the Psak that we want over here. Now, going back to the establishment of the Halacha of Kafrisin, Yumara notes that Ravina once found Marba Ravashi, who was eating the Kafrisin in Chutzlaretz, even though it was Arla. So you see, he held that it was not a fruit because he was eating it. He was going with this same opinion as Rabbi Kiva. So the Gemara says that Ravina asked him, listen, you uh, you hold like Rabbi Akiva? Maybe you should hold like Bishamai. Who's Bishamai? Bishamai says it's not even a question of whether it's fruit or not. The whole sloth plant is a vegetable. And therefore, Arla doesn't apply to any part of the Tzlaf plant. The Gemara shows us where you see that Beishami holds away. The Gemara says, Machok is Beishel Beishamai, about whether you can plant the Tzlaf plant in a vineyard. Now, the Lachas, you're not allowed to plant vegetables next to grapevines. So, the uh, Tzlaf plant, Beishamai says, you're not allowed to plant it. It's Kelayim in a vineyard because it's a vegetable. And Beishel says, no, it's not. It's a tree, and you're allowed to. And the Gemara adds another halacha here that comes from this b'risa. The Gemara says, Beis Hill and Mishamai both agree that the tzlaf plant is chayv and arla. So the Gemara points out that this is a stira. Beis Shammai, on the one hand, says that it is a vegetable and you're not allowed to plant it in a vineyard. On the other hand, he says that it's a tree because it's chayv and arla. So stira Beis Shammai. The Gemara says, Beis Shammai is not sure whether it's a vegetable or a tree. He's mesupik and he goes to Chumar both ways. You're not allowed to plant it in a vineyard because maybe it's a vegetable, and you have to take Arlo because maybe it's a treat. Now, that being the case, you could hold like Beis Shammai, and you would not have to worry about Arlo in Chutzlaretz, because the halacha is that Suffolk Arlo in Chutzlaretz is always Lakula, because Arlo is not a, is is only a Zecher in Chutzlaretz, every Suffolk is Lakula. Therefore, you could hold like Beis Shammai, and it's a Suffolk, and you could go Lakula. The Gemara brings a rice that it says that, in Chutzla, in in Eretz Yisrael, Arla is the In Surya, it's Mutter. And in Chutzla, you have allowed to go to a store and buy from somebody who doesn't separate his new and his old fruits, as long as you know that he's not for sure giving you new fruits. Okay, so the Gemara says, no, we're not going to pass on like Beishamai. Beishamai doesn't count as a Mishnah at all. Beis Hillel is always correct. We do not view Beishamai as a Shita altogether. So we're going to go like Rabbi Kiva. If you want to hold that, you don't have to take Arla from it. The Gemara now moves on to a new discussion in the Lacha of Arla as it pertains to this Kafrisin flower of the Tzlaf plant. The Gemara says, okay, I'll grant you that the Kafrisin is not part of the fruit, but it should be Arla anyway, because the Lacha is that a protective part of a plant, something that protects the fruit, is considered to be part of the fruit, and the Lacha of Arla applies to it as well. So therefore, this Kafrisin protects the plant. It should also have Hilchas Arla. The Gemara quotes the is to include something which is part of the fruit, but not really the fruit. So the Gemara is going to answer this by saying that uh, the flower doesn't count as a real protective, and the Gemara is going to compare three plants that have a similar protective flower. We had the Tzlaf, we're also going to have the same thing exists by the Remine, and the same thing exists by Tamarim, the Dates. So the Gemara says, Rava tries to say the following thing. Rava says this doesn't count as real protective, because it falls off. It, it it does not stay on the fruit after it is picked. It's not a peel. Only something which is a peel that stays on, that counts as protective in order to be chayven hilchas arla. So Abayi says it's not true. You're right, it falls off. But a rimoin has the same type of flower that falls off. A pomegranate has the same type of a flower that falls off. And in the f- in the Rimain, it does count as protective so that Helchus Arla applies to it. How do you know? Through the following halacha. A Rimain's protective flower doesn't count for Tumas Eichlin, so that means that it's not food. It's not considered food. But it does count for Helchus Arla. So the reason must be that it's a protective aspect. It's a shimer. It's a protection for the fruit. So that proves 
that it is counted as protective even though it falls off, and therefore the same thing should apply to Tzlaf, even though the Tzlaf falls off. So Rava comes back and he says there's a difference. The Rima's flower stays on until the end of the development of the fruit, but the Tzlaf falls off in the early stages of the development while the fruit is still very small and unripe. So therefore it doesn't count as protective. So the Gemara says, but hold on a second, but the date flower falls off very early in the stages. And the date flower is considered protective, and it is considered arla because of that. The Gemara says, "How do you know that the flower of the dates is considered protective?" I have a statement of Rav Nachman in the name of Rabbi Baravu, who says so. The Gemara says, "No, that doesn't prove anything." Rav Nachman holds like Rav Yosi. Rav Yosi considers the tiniest fruit in the earliest stage of development to be fruit. That's why he says it's protective, because that flower is still on there in its tiny early stages, and he holds like Rabbi that that counts as fruit. But we don't hold like Rabbi and therefore, by us, according to our shita, it will not count as protective unless it's on when the fruit is fully developed, and therefore doesn't count as protective. The Gemara now says, hold on, and not so fast. You're right, there is a shita of the Rabbanan that we hold like that argues on Rabbi and holds that grapes are not considered to be fruits in their early stages of development, but that's only by grapes. There is no such machlekes, and we all do agree to Rabbi Yaisi that early stages are considered to be fruits by other trees, which includes its slaf. Where do we see this? It's in a mission which discusses the halacha of cutting down Shemitah trees. You're not to cut down a Shemitah tree that has fruit. The Gemara says, according to Beis Hillel, we have in the Mishnah, there is different halachas for different trees. The halacha of grapes, this Mishnah says, is that it's you're not allowed to cut it down when it's in the stage called Voisar the middle growth stage where it has grown to the size of a white bean or there's a seed in it. So that's the stage at which you're not allowed to cut down a uh, Shemitah grapevine. But all other trees, as soon as the fruit starts to to, to, uh, appear in the smallest form, you're not allowed to cut it down. So now... uh, uh, the Gemara says, who is this Shita here? This is not Rabbi Yaisi, because clearly it says that grapes, you... It's not considered to have fruits until it's in a mid-grown stage, the size of a white bean. So it must be the Rabbanon. And you see that they only argue under BIC as far as grapes go. But by other trees, they say that as soon as the first fruit begins to appear in its smallest form, it's considered to be fruit. So now, therefore... We do not have a Rabbi Yaisi, we do not have a, we do not have a Rabbanon Shita that argues on a Rabbi Yaisi that we could hide behind and say that we do not consider Tzlaf to be fruits until it's mid-stage. And therefore, the protective flower falls off too early, and therefore it doesn't count as a shamer. So we're back stuck with Akasha that that flower should be considered a shamer, a guard for the fruit, and it should have Hilchas Arla because of that. So the Gemara now offers a new answer. Rava says it's only considered to be a shamer for the fruit to be Chayiv and Arla if when you take off this shamer, the fruit will die. But that is not true for Tzlaf. Slaf, if you take off this kafrisen flower, the fruit will stay alive. The Gemara says it was an incident where they pulled off the flower from a remind, and it actually happened that the remind fruit dropped dead, but in a slaf it does not. Therefore, it's not considered a shimer, and that's the reason why it does not have the halacha of Arla. Now, there is a piece stuck here in the Gemara, which is removed by the Marshal, because it's not really Gemara, it's from the Bahag. The Bahag adds in, and therefore the Halacha is that you do not say a bracha by your Priya 8, you say a by your Priya Adam. The Gemara now discusses the Halacha of black, not really edible, so what the bracha would you say on that? Rav Shesha says a shakal, Rav says no bracha at all, you don't get anything out of it, and if you eat it on your Kippur, you're not chayev. The same thing applies to ginger. The Gemara asks, and Rav says that Arla applies to it, we have the Pasuk of Arla, which uses the word Piryoy, and then it says Eitz Machol, it says it's fruit, and then it says it's a fruit tree, you want to have to say them both. I teach you that it includes Arla applies even to a fruit which tastes like tree, the tree tastes like fruit. Um, you also learn from me that Eretz Yisrael is not missing anything, the Gemara says. So, if it is Chayv in Arla, then don't tell me I don't say a bracha on it. The Gemara says there's two types here. When the pepper is fresh and it's moist, it's edible, you say shahakal. When it's dried, you can't eat it, you don't say shahakal. And the Gemara discusses ginger. Same thing we said that is, you're not high for an Yom Kippur. The Gemara asks, but when it's made in a porridge, the people in the in the African lands eat it for healing, so we saw that you say a bracha ha'etz on it. You say a bracha ha'adam on it. I'm sorry, so... Um, why Why do you say that you're not chay for it on Yom Kippur? The says, again, there's a difference if it's moist and fresh or if it's dried. Then the discusses another type of 
porridge which is fermented in a pot made out of a mixture of honey and flour and oil. The Gemara says, Rabbi Hida says it's shahako, and Rabbi Kana says it's a mazoinus. So Gemara says, if you're talking about regular porridge, not a machlekes, that's mazoinus for sure. We're talking about this one, where it's fermented. So, what's a machlekes? Rabbi Hida says that the honey is the main part of it, and therefore it's a shahako. Rabbi Kana says that the flour is the main part, and therefore it's a mazoinus. The Gemara says, Rabbi Yosef says it's logical to a and like Rav and Shmuel. Because the halacha usually is that anything made from the five grains is a mizainus. The five grains are not considered to be insignificant in any mixture.